Welcome to the ICU podcast, where we explore the vestibular experience through conversations between patients and the health professionals who care for them. During this podcast, we invite patients to share their stories and healthcare professionals to ask questions so they are equipped to better care for and truly see the invisible challenges faced by their patients. I'm Kimberly Warner. And I'm Cynthia Ryan. And we are your hosts on this journey of discovery. Welcome, everyone, to 2024, the ICU podcast. I can't believe we're actually in year two of this series. I'm really looking forward to another year of conversations. This um, January, we are beginning with primary care and the role of physician assistants in vestibular healthcare. This is a big one because every one of us touches at some point or another, the primary care practitioner scenario. And I think it's important to learn a little bit more about how to navigate this. So primary care uh, practitioners are often the first healthcare professionals we seek when we feel dizzy, disoriented, or not quite right. Their role is to take a medical history and assess whether we can be treated immediately with medication or therapy, or whether we need to be referred to a specialist for further testing. One challenge, however, is that by definition, primary care physicians, practitioners are generalists and may not know enough about the signs and symptoms of vestibular impairment to triage patients appropriately. The good news is that there are advanced practice providers, such as nurse practitioners and physician assistants, who specialize in otolaryngology that can serve as a first point of contact to help dizzy patients get on the road to recovery more quickly. So today we have two fabulous guests. Um, Cynthia, you want to introduce our first guest? Thank you. Welcome everyone, um, and we have with us today Maria McCullough, who's a certified nurse practitioner and the director of the Dizziness and Balance Clinic at the University of Colorado, where she specializes in otology and neurotology. She has a special interest in particular in vestibular migraine and in the overlap between migraine and Meniere's disease, which we all know there's a lot of overlap, um, as well as other vestibular conditions. She serves as a guest lecturer at the physician assistant and nurse practitioner schools there within the University of Colorado and is a clinical mentor to the students in these programs. She also teaches advanced practice providers who work in otolaryngology how to perform otologic, otologic excuse me, that's a lot of O's, otologic <laughs> procedures and comprehensive vestibular evaluations. Welcome, Maria. We are so happy to have you here to talk about this topic today. Thank you. Happy to be here. And Lindsay, today our patient guest, but also more than patient, uh, Lindsay Masigwa is from Dayton, Ohio, where she lives with her husband, son, and two dogs. One dog is, her name is Jazzy, a German Shepherd, who is uh, Lindsay's service dog. She has been a nurse since 2008 and is currently an associate nurse manager on an advanced cardiac floor. Her vestibular journey began in 2016 with minor episodes of vertigo and dizziness. And then she had periods of brain fog. And then the true nightmare began in September of 2022 when the episodes became severe and debilitating. She was diagnosed with vestibular migraine in October 2022 and then PPPD in November of 2023. Having a vestibular disorder has affected her professional and personal life as we all can relate to. Mm -hmm. She is trying to spread awareness and education to help other vestibular warriors who are suffering get relief with quicker diagnosis and treatment. Welcome, Lindsay. I'm so happy to have you here with us. Happy to be here. I just wish Jazzy was here with us. Is she next to you? Um, Well, she is. She's asleep in the corner right now. (laughs) I've had her working all day. Um, well, Lindsay, do you want to um, actually get, help us get started here and just tell us a little bit about your vestibular story and how you were diagnosed? Yes, of course. It's kind of a long journey, but um, I'll try to summarize as much as I can through everything. So um, as we said, it started in 2016. I like, started getting these episodes of like brain fog, like vertigo, dizziness, 
Um, but they really weren't too severe then. Like it was enough for me to be like, okay, like those are there, like what just happened. Um, but they would like quickly pass then. Um, I reached out to my primary care doctor then. Um, and um, then I um, had some like scans and stuff. They didn't find anything um, that was wrong. Um, went to my ENT doctor at that time. They kind of did the same thing. They couldn't find anything wrong. And it was like, it was kind of hard to explain like how I was feeling because they would like come and go so quickly then. Um, it wasn't like truly affecting my life so much at that time. So like as the years went on, just kind of like let it go. Like if I got an episode, sat down, everything would be okay. Um, but then in 2022, September, um, my episodes started getting really severe. Um, the first one I can remember, um, I was at work and um, I got a very um, bad vertigo spell. Everything started spinning and it was spinning so fast that I couldn't even stand up. Like I fell over and my coworkers luckily were there enough and they caught me. So I ended up just going home. I went to my primary care doctor the next day. We did a CT scan, some lab work, everything came back fine. So she's like, well, we'll just kind of watch it for a while, see how it goes. Um, you're, you're, uh, you just had a birthday, so you're like a year older. So we'll chalk it up to that for right now. <laughs> So, um, but as like the time kept going, like the next week, like things just kept getting worse, like more symptoms started coming on, um, started having problems with like my eyes, like abnormal movements, the vertigo and the dizziness just wasn't passing. Um, so I reached back out to her and she, um, consulted neuro, but, um, Getting to a neurologist as a new patient, outpatient, is a long wait. <laughs> so um, I was like just waiting for that appointment, um, but um, things just like kept progressing, and I'm like something is seriously wrong. Like I was getting to the point that I started to have trouble walking at times because my balance was so bad. Um, and I was trying to work, um, and it just wasn't working out for me. So I ended up going to my first ER visit um, where they gave me a COVID test um, and gave me the migraine cocktail um, and um, just kind of like let me sleep that off. And then they're like, you're good to go home. And that's all that happened there. Um so then I kept kind of reaching out to my primary care doctor and she like wasn't quite sure like what was going on either at the time. Um, so we were just waiting for the neurologist appointment. Um, but my symptoms were just to the point that I, I just couldn't sit and wait. Like I was, um, I needed to work or figure out what was going on. I was missing work um, on a daily basis. So it was like I just kind of kept advocating for myself and trying to go to different places. So ended up going to another ER um, um, a visit. And at that point, they thought maybe I had MS at this ER. So they're like, if we wait for an MRI, then you're going to sit probably in the ER for like two to four days before we can get the MRI done. So it's better if we just send you home. And we send you to our neurology group. So, um, yeah. So leaving there, so then I ended up with two neurology appointments. And both of them were like a month or more wait. Um, but I took it upon myself just to go see um, one of the MS specialists um, at a different facility um, who didn't think it was MS. But she's like, there's definitely something going on. Just I just don't believe it's MS. So I um, ended up trying to go back to work. And when mm -hmm. I was working, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I ended up with another like really bad spell. Um, I was um, going to one of our staff emergencies on our unit. And um, when I went to go back to my office, um, the vertigo hit, my eyes kind of rolled back. My coworkers caught me again. Luckily, they were always there to catch me, so I didn't hit the floor. Um, but after this episode, I couldn't talk. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, am I in shock? Like, what's going on? Like, you know, I was just like kind of in like disbelief, like to see me back to my office, whatever this is will go away. So I'm like trying to work and not like it, ever, no, nothing was coming back. I was so lightheaded. Um, it was like 25 minutes. I still couldn't talk. I knew what I wanted to say, but I just, I couldn't like make my mouth, everything do the motions to get those words out. So I ended up having a stroke alert called on me um, during work and taken to the ER. Um, And I spent like five days hospitalized and I still didn't have an answer when I left. I was diagnosed with anxiety, (laughs) Um, leaving, leaving that day. Because they thought when I went to the staff emergency, it made me anxious. And that's why I couldn't talk and I was dizzy and everything. Um, But I did get a referral for vestibular therapy um, because there was one therapist that really advocated for me during like my hospital stay. And she's like, oh, there is something going on. Like she needs to go to vestibular therapy. So, you know, I, I can appreciate that person that really like tried hard to advocate for me for the doctors and she ended up getting me to a great therapist. Um, and then um, right before I started vestibular therapy is when I um, went to one of those neurology appointments and spent like a lot of time with them, like three hours with assessments and everything. And that's when I was diagnosed in October of 2022 with vestibular migraines. Um, wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, wow. Your story is, I mean, it's, we, we hear these long diagnosis stories all the time, but your story is really amazing in so many ways. And one of the things that I, I, I think to, I directly relates to the topic that we're talking about today is how, you know, you kept in, you kept seeing primary care providers that couldn't help you and they were doing the right thing by referring you to a specialist, but that weight for the specialist so yeah, long it's, it's in between. Time. So I think that's one of the things that, yeah. you know, this discussion today is really applicable to is how can we help patients who who need need vestibular care at the primary care level. So yeah. And yeah. if they didn't have anxiety before <laughs> this all started, they certainly right. will after being shuffled around, told they might have MS told, you know, going to so many different doctors. I mean, it's like, no wonder there's, it, there's an escalation of symptoms through this process. Yeah. 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 It took like a lot of advocating, like for myself too, like something's not right. Like, I know it's not anxiety. So it's not this. And it was like, my primary care was great. Like she's been great through the whole process. Um, but with like what she, like she didn't know about all like the vestibular stuff at the time. So um, going through that process and a lot of advocating for myself. And I'm like, I'm in the healthcare field. So like, I knew like, I know what avenues to take where if someone's not in the healthcare field, they might not know what to take. And yes, those wait times are waiting six months to see a neurologist is very hard, especially when you're like young and you need to provide for your family and people can't wait six months. Yeah. You can't put your life on hold for six months and, and you're, you're, your work yeah. isn't going to wait for you either. That's it's such a challenge for so many people. So, yes. wow, I'm so sorry for all that you went through. Yeah. Maria, let me ask you, um, let me ask you this. So, you know, we're talking about primary care and, and getting, um, getting, pri- getting patients connected with someone who understands vestibular care early in their um, diagnostic journey. Now you're a a nurse practitioner and I know that you, so you, you specialize though, you're not in primary care. Can you tell us about what, how how did you get into specializing in vestibular disorders or otolaryngology and what does that look like? Sure. So um, I started working in ENT uh, about nine years ago. And I always had an interest in it. You know, I worked as a as a nurse, a bedside nurse in the hospital here at University of Colorado, um, and would work with the ENT team here and there, and always just found it fascinating. So when I finished NP school, um, I knew I wanted to be an ENT. 
And then um, I actually subspecialize in otology and neurotology. So it's a subspecialty that deals with disorders of um, hearing imbalance and then skull base, like skull base tumors. So um, over the past nine years, I've been really fortunate to work with um, some really well-known physicians and vestibular in the vestibular world. Um, Carol Foster, um, Herman Jenkins, Steve Cass, and they really ignited my passion for it. And then um, just knowing the gaps in healthcare, uh, like your story, Lindsay, I hear that all too commonly. Um, it's motivated me to make it the primary focus of my practice now um, and improve patient access to care. Um, I, I applaud what you're doing. I mean, I, I feel like it's, it's one of those areas that once you know about it, it seems so obvious that everyone should have this some tiny little bit of training so that this process of diagnostics can happen more quickly and efficiently. Um, so thank you. Yeah, for what I, you're think, doing. I think part of it is, um, you know, there can be so many different causes of dizziness that really span the specialties. And so um, I think that's where uh, where there are gaps, you know, um, if you rule yeah. it out of your specialty, then it's kind of hard to know which direction to go in. I think that's a really good point. Um, actually, Lindsay, I'm curious what you would say about that. Since you too, you're a vestibular patient and a healthcare professional. Um, what do you think the challenges are for primary care providers in helping people with vestibular impairments get the right care? Yeah, I think um, the biggest, I think the biggest obstacle is just like the lack of awareness, like with vestibular conditions. I mean, especially like in the area that I live in, it's like um, so many of our providers just don't, uh, um, just aren't aware of like the vestibular conditions. A lot of them know about like BPPV, but it seems like beyond that, um, they're not just, they don't have like the awareness of it. Um, also, like as we discussed, like the wait times, it's like, you know, you're getting dizziness and all these different symptoms and they're not sure where it's coming from. So yeah, they're sending them off to the specialists. Um, but then it's like, we're waiting months and months for those specialists. Um, and I think like they just need to know, like know the steps to like take to like help the patients um, at what they can do from their level, like sending to like vestibular therapy and stuff. Um, my vestibular therapist has been great. And I wish like if I could have started with that, you know, from like maybe like the first visit when I started having um, those issues, we might have been able to get somewhere a little bit faster. Mm hmm. I think you're right. And I also, because you visited the ER a couple times too, it's probably, it's where we go when we're having an emergency. I did multiple visits as well in the early stages, but that almost compounds the, the um, comp it, it complicates things even more because when those um, notes get sent back to your primary care physician, they're getting even more data that might just be like, well, she came in with a lot of anxiety or we gave her a COVID test or, you know, and so then they're drawing from almost too much information than just seeing you as you are. Do you feel that way that the, the ER visits complicate it? Um, I feel like the ER visits, they um, just wanted to try to like fix like what was happening right then. Um, and like they would do like the CT scans and they're like, okay, they're great. You can go back home. Um, I don't feel like there was, they kind of like lacked more of like what was, what could like cause dizziness, um, and patients or like, I don't want to say like they lacked like the caring. Um, I think it's just with the vestibular conditions too, like sometimes it's so hard for me to describe how I'm feeling or like what I'm describing, like they're not understanding either, you know, like when the flat, how like floors look tilted or like patterns, like I lose my balance on them. It's like, they're like, what do you mean? Like that causes, you know, you know, you, um, you to fall or whatever. Um, so um, I think the ER is just like, 
now going through all those ER visits, I'm like, if I have like major flares, I'm like, that's the last place I would go. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's the thing is yeah. in, in human medicine and, and our medical system, everyone is so specialized, you know, the ER, yeah. the role of yeah. the ER is to deal with acute um, situations mm -hmm. and then to, to send the patient back to primary care or to a specialist. I was actually <laughs> was listening to a, a comedian recently. I'm, I'm, I can picture him in my head, but I can't remember his name, but he was describing um, a visit that he, he was taking his Bengal cat, his older Bengal cat to a veterinarian. And he was making kind of fun of the fact that here's a veterinarian who has to be an expert in um, cat anatomy and dog anatomy and bird anatomy and reptile anatomy. And in humans, you have people who are an expert in the ear <laughs> and the eye. I mean, it's not just one species, it's one one organ <laughs> or one system. Yeah. So, um, and you know, obviously there, there are reasons for that, which is part of what we're talking about. Maria, I, I, I wanted to ask you um, about what you said when you said that you were you were going through um, NP or nurse practitioner school, and then and you always you you worked with um, uh, the ENT team. You knew you wanted to specialize in that. How do you know that that's? I, I think a lot of people don't know that that um, primary care providers like nurse practitioners and phys uh, physicians assistants specialize. Can you? Can you talk about how, you know, how, how many of them do that and how do you find them? Yeah. So I think it's important to understand um, how both nurse practitioners and physician assistants, uh, which collectively were known as APPs, advanced practice providers. So I'll say APPs um, about how we came to be. And so, and what our role is as part of the healthcare team. Um, both roles were created in the 1960s, and it was in response of a, a primary care shortage. And so it was really to increase patients' access to care. And so nurse practitioners um, were nurses with additional training, usually master's or doctorate degrees. And then um, physician assistant, it's a program that was actually modeled after the fast track training for physicians um, in World War II. And so, and that's more of a medical model and they have a master's degree. So um, neither is intended to replace or be a substitute for a physician. We really, um, we all work as part of a team and really our roles kind of complement each other. So um, for example, part of the nursing model is really focused on education um, and, um, and also prevention. So, um, and there are varying roles for APPs. So uh, you can work really closely with a physician and see patients together, or an APP can have more of an independent practice. Um, and this all depends on what the training is, what, what the APP's experience is, what their interests are, and what the needs are of the patients. Um, and so it is general training. You don't really specialize in school. Um, Nurse practitioners are a little bit different. You can do acute care versus primary care. You can do adult versus pediatric. So there's some specializing there, but not really um, with a different like body systems. So, but the point of this, it's, it's actually a good thing. Um, it's general, so it allows for more on the job specialization. And so we can really adapt to the needs of the specific practice or the community in, that, in which we're working. Um, so, and this can really help bridge the gap between these different specialties, like the different specialties that see dizzy patients, you know, it's um, ENT, neurology, even cardiology, primary care, emergency care. Um, so, even though there's not a formal training program for vestibular care, um, I think there are three important things, and this is regardless of the role. So, physician, um, nurse practitioner, PA, or even physical therapist. So, one is having um, a special interest in dizziness. You know, the, the balance system is really fascinating, um, especially the inner ear. And then two, um, having additional training. So we have to do continuing medical education or CMEs, and you can get these through various conferences. There are associations that will do online training. And then the third one, and this is um, maybe the most important is, um, years of experience, and that's working with a mentor, either um, 
formally, like a physician in a residency program or fellowship. And then um, for an APP, it's more on the job experience. And then also years of experience in treating the patients, you know, hearing everybody's unique stories and seeing what the patterns are and seeing what works and what doesn't. So, so no formal training. The best kind of education. I mean, but really, I mean, I, I, I think the best kind of education is what you just named. It's, it's on, on the job and hearing that so many different types of stories and seeing even, even when I started working with Vita three years ago, I was, astounded to know that there were people, you know, like me out there, but then a whole diversity of other walks of life that were also experiencing the same symptoms. And it's just, how do we learn that from a textbook? Right. <laughs> so real quickly, Maria, can I, can I ask for um, just clarification on one thing you were talking about uh, CEUs or continuing education units, the, the mm -hmm. extracurricular training. So, and you were saying that there's, there isn't like a training program specifically for physician assistants or nurse practitioners or APPs. Would you, mm -hmm. I, I'm really familiar with the training programs that there are for physical therapists, um, mm -hmm. uh, especially, um, would you be going to some of those training programs um, so that, that they, that, are you talking about training programs that might be, um, you know, cross specialties? Yeah, so um, the way I've done it, I guess, in ENT, we have Otology and Neurotology Associations, and so learning a lot there. Those are for physicians, but, you know, APPs who specialize in this really benefit from, from these. And then um, I've gone to the, the um, American Neurologic Society, those meetings, talking about migraine. We see vestibular migraine a lot. Um, so kind of picking and choosing, you know, based on what your interests are, you can choose what kind of, um, education you want. Gotcha. So you are basically training with the physicians. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. For the most part. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lindsay, I, I hear that you've, um, created a program to help educate primary care providers. Is that true? Yes, um, we do more than just like the primary care providers, but yes, I did get into starting to educate like any physicians, even nurses and stuff like um, in the healthcare system I work now. Um, hopefully, maybe we can grow that outside of our healthcare system one day, but um, yes, I, so I got into it because like when I, when I came back to work, like I was off for three months, like during like my diagnosis and trying to get back to like a place where I could work again. But when I came back to work, it was so hard. Like I thought I would like going back to like the best like scenario I could be in. Like I work in this great big health system. Like everybody's going to understand what I'm going through. Right. No, <laughs> that wasn't, that wasn't the case. Um, I needed more of like a transition to get back into like this type of environment. And they, um, a lot of people just didn't understand like that vestibular system and like how like environments and stuff can really throw a person off. Um, so I was, I was getting a little frustrated when I came back to work, like why can't everybody just understand like what I'm going through? And like, I know like I need to be like on my full game, you know, taking care of patients, but I'm like, if I get a little dizziness here and there, it doesn't mean that I can't necessarily work. Like I was learning how to handle it myself. Um, but people weren't understanding that. So then I was like, why should I be angry at these people or like frustrated with them for something that I didn't even know myself before it all happened to me? So I knew from my experience and getting the education through my experience with having it. So why not turn my frustration into education for them? So um, started just like reaching out to like, some of like the hospitalists and stuff that I knew very well. Um, they weren't really like sure like how to get, you know, the education. So I was like, one day I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna send an email to the director. I'm just gonna go for it. Um, and I'm gonna see if I get a response or not, but I'm gonna tell them all the reasons why I think this is important. And I got a response. <laughs> um, and wow. they, did, um, they did think it was important, especially, you know, having been a patient of theirs too themselves and um, just how much more like they could um, get from the education. So um, we like meet with our hospitalist group, our neuro groups within 
um, um, our system. And then we do um, a nurse residency program here for new nurses. So yeah. I think it's really exciting because, you know, coming out of school, a lot of them don't know about like vestibular stuff. So they're getting to learn about the vestibular system as they're starting like their new careers in healthcare. Um, we provide them like the verbal education, but then my therapist is involved with me. I like roped him into my education because he was just so great at like teaching me so much about the vestibular um, system and like my conditions that I was like, he'd be the best person to take for that education. So they get to see like some assessments and stuff. Um, they get to see like my abnormal eye movements and like a little bit of flares so they can um, see how like the abnormal assessments would be in a vestibular patient too. Gosh, is this program, can we replicate it? I mean, I'm thinking all the listeners, I would like to have, you know, call the director <laughs> of the hospital here in Portland. And, and you know, seriously though, is, is there something that we can eventually see this happening on a larger scale? Um, maybe it's something that we could look into. I mean, yeah. we, I'm sure we could. I mean, there's recordings or anything that could happen. I'm not sure exactly, but I'm like, I'm sure it can be recorded and everything too. So yeah, that yeah, might be something that we can look into. We should definitely talk about um, doing a, you know, a formal recording of a, um, we could do a virtual presentation and, and record it that people could bring to their hospitals. I mean, I think it's great, as you said, Kimberly, that you would, as a patient, like to bring something and share your experience with your local hospital. And I think that that's something that they would really be more, even more open to. But, um, and, and there's that opportunity as well. I mean, Lindsay and her uh, physical therapist have developed this wonderful PowerPoint that they're willing to share. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah. and I, I think that, we, yes. I mean, that's, that's one of the things that brought this, um, this episode together mm -hmm. was discussions with Maria and, um, uh, and the society, uh, uh, for, uh, physicians assistance of otolaryngology and using, you know, leveraging what they're doing, the awareness that they're, that they are awareness raising that they're doing. So that's definitely something we should talk about. Uh, uh, online, yeah. but I just I love I love the passion that you bring to this, Lindsay, and I I love your attitude that you know why should I blame them for not understanding when you know I didn't understand before or you you know you didn't understand before you yeah. know we all come from a place of ignorance until we either experience something or are educated, and so it's, yeah, yeah that's that's just such a a great perspective. So, so Maria, um, we all want to know, how do we find people like you? <laughs> you know, how does, how does someone, you know, in, in Portland, Oregon, um, or in um, Sarasota, Florida, find a primary, an advanced practice, pra pra advanced practice practitioner, or, you know, a primary care provider um, who, who, who knows about vestibular disorders? Yeah, I, I mean, that's, it's tough. It's not because it's not its own specialty. And like I said, it, it spans multiple specialties. So it's hard to find somebody who's interested in it, you know, as a whole. Um, I think, you know, I love the VITA directory. I think that's great. Um, you can find providers that way. Um, but just knowing who uh, your ENT, your local ENTs are in the area. Um, not all ENTs will see your specializing dizziness, but they will at least kind of know, you know, there's a good referral network. Um, and then also neurologists, I would say just knowing who your contacts are in those areas and how to refer. So, and then physical therapists. Yeah. Yeah. Our, yeah. The physical therapists we work with are yeah. Excellent. And, you know, Lindsay, you were saying that, you know, you had gotten a referral to a physical therapist and then you did end up seeing one of the neurologists first. But but that is sometimes what happens for people is they 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 can see a physical therapist that you need to have that appointment with your neurologist or an ENT because that that's the process yeah. to get a diagnosis. But sometimes seeing a physical therapist just gives you that, OK, I'm just going to treat my symptoms for now while I'm figuring out what's going, what's, what's wrong. Um, and often the physical therapist has a network. 
you know, and, and just seeing that one, you can, you can find a vestibular physical therapist on Vita's website, and they've got networks within their, their local healthcare systems. Yeah. And I mean, as a patient, I think it's like finding that one like physician that or like neurologist specialist, whoever you feel comfortable with. I mean, to be honest, as a patient, I, honestly, like I've switched neurologists three times already um, because the person diagnosed me. It's like um, they were great at diagnosing, but I didn't feel like well managed or like I felt like things were still progressing. And it was like my symptoms were pretty severe and it was like. I didn't feel like sometimes she always believed me. So I had to find like that person that I felt very comfortable with and fully trust. And actually like my um, physical therapist um, referred me to a neurologist and that's who I see now. So we like did this big old circle, but to get back to where um, I could have been in like in the beginning, probably with him. So now that you have your diagnosis, Lindsay, and you're in good care, do you feel, and or have you gone back to the original primary care provider to, I mean, I'm using air quotes, educate them, which is probably, you know, horrible, I'm gonna educate you. But um, do, do you find some sort of responsibility to going back or do you feel that there is a role that patients can play in that in educating their PCPs? Yes, I do think patients can really help like their PCPs, especially with, you know, any type of like disorder that's not common for like a primary care provider to treat. For me, like my me and my PCP have gotten really close um, through all this diagnosis and she's been great. And she's like, you know, I've learned so much from you, like as a patient. And, um, you know, she's like, when I look back, like, is there more that I could have done in the beginning? Like, I remember, like, seeing her after I got diagnosed, and she's like, I always keep, like, the ER flow sheet up, and she's like, when I saw a stroke alert on you, she's like, my heart hit the ground, and I was like, I totally missed it. You know, like, she was, like, afraid, too. Um, so, with me and her, yes, like, I have taught her so much, and she's, it's actually having me as a patient. She's like, she's, um, I'm looking for the word. She's like researched a lot more too, to learn what she can. So, um, but I guess I encourage any vestibular patient, like just educate anybody you can, whether it's your PCP or whoever is in healthcare, you know, or anybody out there, just let them know about vestibular patients and what we go through on a daily basis. Wow, that's so encouraging to hear how your PCP responded too. And to think about all the patients that followed you, that walked into her office, that she was able to help more efficiently because of you sharing and walking with her. Um, I just, I, that's really cool. Yeah, it's, it's really like, even with like the education, like here in like my hospital, Sometimes it's like, it's kind of neat. Like I'll just have like a doctor walk up and be like, okay, so which vestibular therapy, where do I send my patient to? Mm -hmm. Or like my patient's having some dizziness. Do you think that they could help with this? And I'm like, yes, yeah, send them. <laughs> so awesome. it's like just seeing like the outcome of it has been really great too for patients in this area. Awesome. I love that. So Maria, what, what is the future for um, primary care professionals who healthcare professionals who want to get more involved in treating dizzy patients what can what what would you yeah. advise to to someone who who wants to get more training yeah so well one of the things i want to talk about is um you know because there are so many different specialties i think it's important to have um you know a point person so what what we're trying to develop here at the university of colorado is um a specialized dizziness and balance clinic that has ENT, neurology, physical therapy, um, all working and talking together. I think, you know, to avoid this bouncing around to multiple people waiting months and months. Um, and one of the best and easiest ways to do that is to have a team of APPs see the patients initially. We can usually get patients in a lot quicker. Um, we can do all the, you know, we can do the examination, the diagnostic, testing interpretation we can do a lot of the management and then have a way to get the patients into a neurologist or an ent surgeon if needed 
um, so that you avoid those long wait times. I mean, really time is of the essence for a lot of these disorders. You can develop 3PD if you have vertigo that's untreated for you know months, years, things like that. Um, so, yes. so I think, um, you know, as far as primary care, just knowing who you can refer to um, and then using your resources. So there are a lot of great associations that deal with dizziness. You know, VIA, I think it's probably the most well-known, a lot of great resources. Um, there's the Association of Migraine Disorders. I think that one's really important. Um, I would say vestibular migraine is probably the most common cause of dizziness that I see. I mean, though that's more a neurologic problem, we see it a lot in ENT, there's a lot of symptom overlap. Um, so just knowing that that is a possibility. Um, things like Meniere's disease, they're a lot less common than people realize. So um, just knowing kind of the difference between the inner ear and neurologic causes of dizziness, um, and so you know when to refer to a neurologist versus ENT. So it sounds like um, what you're talking about is, a, is APPs being part of a multidisciplinary um, team, um, a, mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a, a comprehensive balance clinic. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, multidisciplinary, multi-specialty. So mm -hmm. physical therapists, audiologists, MDs, APPs, and then multi-specialty. Mm -hmm. so. Right. Yeah. We, we definitely know that when people get referred to a multidisciplinary team, you know, in a, a, a balanced clinic that has, you know, all the specialties working together is, is mm -hmm. the other key that they, that they are, uh, that they get help more quickly and that, and, mm -hmm. uh, and they get, they get a, a diagnosis more quickly. They get referred to treatment more quickly um, so that's definitely something that Vita is, is trying to promote is the development of these, of more, you know, cause they're right now we, we, we know that they're in major metropolitan areas, but what if you're not in a ma major metropolitan area? Yeah, I, I am imagining that between the work that you're doing, Maria, and obviously Vita, but then Lindsay, your work, if, I mean, we have maybe 500 to 1,000 listeners per episode. So if every single one of you listening right now grabs the recording that we're going to do with Lindsay on her next yeah. um, PCP training, <laughs> and they take that to their hospital, imagine how many more hospitals around, you know, rural communities and, you know, less, you know, metropolis communities are going to have this information. I mean, that's a big change. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Reach out to Vita if you want to be an advocate. We we that's we need more advocates. So yeah, and yeah, definitely. Thank you both for for being advocates and for uh, and for helping us raise awareness in your in your healthcare communities about the exp the vestibular patient experience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having I me. I feel hopeful. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we have a lot of work yeah. to do, but this is um, this gives me a lot of hope. Yes, so. good message. Yeah. Definitely, there's a lot of work to do, but that's what we're here to do it. So, thank you, everybody who's listening, and um, thank you, Kimberly, uh, Lindsay, and Maria. Thanks for tuning in to ICU this month. We hope this conversation sparked new understanding of the vestibular journey, and for all of our patients out there leaves you feeling just a little more heard and a little more seen. I see you.